So here we are, forbidden topics, uh, lessons that'll get you criticized, called out, or canceled, especially the material that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, this is le lesson number nine in our uh, series, and it is entitled The Alphabet Gender Wars. I, I couldn't come up with anything else to try to include <laughs> all the things we're going to talk about here. So the Alphabet Gender Wars. And I think the easiest thing to do is to show you a headline, just to show you what we have to deal with here. Here's a headline. 16% of Generation Z, that's one in six, from a survey done by the Gallup organization, we're not just talking about anybody here, the Gallup organization, which is a, a legitimate uh, you know, uh, survey uh, organization, polling organization, uh, and they took just uh, recently, 16% of Generation Z, uh, those are born uh, between 1997 and 2002. In other words, those between the ages of 19 and 24. Look what the headline says. Nearly 16% of Generation Z identify as LGBT. 16% identify as LGBT. This generation grew up with communication technology, cell phones, social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, on and on. And entertainment, not just entertainment, entertainment on demand. You know, when, when most of us were kids, if you wanted your favorite cartoon or your favorite show or something, it was Saturday morning, you know, oh yeah, there we go. What was the bell? What was the name of the show with the bell? Uh, Saved, by the bell. Saved by the bell, I remember for teenagers, young teenagers. But if you wanted to watch it, you couldn't watch it on a Wednesday or a Tuesday. You had to wait till Saturday. Today, you know, entertainment on demand, you can watch all the series, uh, you know, the, all 15 series, uh, uh, episodes rather of the year uh, and binge watch them. This is the generation that has grown up uh, with this, entertainment on demand, Netflix, Twitch, Disney, whatever. They get their news and their worldview from Google. Not from the Wall Street Journal, they get it from Google, from Facebook, that's where they get their news, YouTube. When they want to know who they are, they get their answers from these sources, not their parents, not the church or the Bible, heaven forbid, but from the internet and the voices and images staring back at them from their screens, which they stare at for an average of four hours and 15 minutes per day. 25 years ago, I produced a book about homosexuality entitled Gay Rights or Wrongs, which basically explained the growing influence of the gay lifestyle in our society by what was then a group that represented no more than 2% of the population of the United States, one and a half to 2%, 25, 30 years ago. 25 years later, we are bombarded by demands for special rights and laws facilitating the deconstruction of gender norms, which have been taken for granted by virtue of their obvious reality since the beginning of the human race. Many people are surprised, you know, and, and they're in shock wondering, how did we get to this point in our, in our history? that we have to actually defend the classic ideal model of acceptable sexual morality, which is monogamous heterosexual lifetime union between a man and a woman. You know, that's the ideal. And it's been the ideal for thousands of years in every country, in every social situation, in every culture. Today, 
Every part of that equation is being challenged socially, legally, medically, and morally. So much so that a letter system has been marketed in order to identify individual departures from the ideal, as well as a statement of solidarity among the various deviations from the previous universally accepted norms. So for information's sake, let's break down the letter system used for identification purposes in our day and age. L is for lesbian, a woman who is attracted to other women. G is for gay, a man who is attracted to other men. Previously, we used to say homosexual, but now gay. Also a general term used for both men and women who have same sex attraction. B, bisexual, a person attracted to both men and women. T, transgender. This is a person whose gender identity is different than their biological gender. In other words, a man who presents as a woman, transgender. Then there's transsexual. That's a person who has permanently changed their gender presentation through drugs and surgery. That's the difference between transgender and transsexual. Q for queer, the genetic term referring to any person who has identical or who has identified away from the traditional norm. If, you, if you've identified away from the traditional norm, you can say, ah, I'm queer, and you know, that'll, that'll give a, uh, uh, an immediate identification. Then there's queer with a question mark. That's someone who's still seeking a gender identity away from the traditional norm. You have I for intersex. That's an individual whose anatomy or chromosomes do not fit the natural male or female biology. And this is a, this is a rare uh, a medical condition. Letter A stands for ally. This is a heterosexual who supports and promotes the LGBTQ plus lifestyle and social and political agenda. Another A is for asexual. This is an individual not sexually attracted to either males or female partners. Uh, this is not the same as someone who is celibate by choice. Asexual has various subtypes, but are individuals who have low or no desire for sexual contact. And then one more, P, pansexual, a person attracted to every type of sexual identification and practice. That's why it's LGBTQ plus. The plus is all the rest of this stuff here. Uh, and, and more, and you know, we keep adding more and more. Now there are other subcategories and gender types and composite types that continue to engage and emerge and multiply as we speak to a point that gender studies departments that constantly dissect and reinterpret the identity and the meaning and the purpose and the malfunction of gender have become the norm on college campuses all across the nation. You know, we have uh, science studies, biblical studies, now we have gender studies. As a matter of fact, Christian universities like Oklahoma Christian have to obtain a special waiver under Title IX from the Department of Education in order to exempt the school from having to have such a department. Uh, I'm afraid, however, that that may not go on for much longer. 
So this briefly is where we are in this country where the LGBTQ plus alliance has gained enormous social and political power. Examples of which can be seen in the headlines I referred to concerning Generation Z or the recent attempt by the Biden administration to nominate Dr. Rachel Levine, who is a pediatrician uh, and who is also a biological male, formerly Richard uh, Levine, presenting as a transgendered female, not transsexual, transgendered, you know the difference, that's how he presents, transgender female, to serve as the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. I mean, think about that for a second. This person is an enthusiastic promoter of radical hormone treatment and surgery on children and teens in order to complete gender reassignment to youth suffering with sexual confusion and gender dysphoria a condition where the young person has confusion concerning their biological gender and how that gender is to be expressed. The majority of these dealing with this issue work it out naturally through role modeling, encouragement, and proper information concerning this condition. They work it out, they're teenagers, there's sexual confusion. I know it should be simple, but there's sexual confusion. What am I? Am I a man? Am I a woman? You know, what am I? Well, you know, role modeling and encouraging and so on and so forth by mom and dad. Mom who's a, a woman and dad who is a man. And dad shows you what a man is. Mom shows you what a woman is. Dr. Levine, promotes gender re-identification through powerful hormones and radical surgery. And this treatment, here's, here's the punchline, and all of this treatment available without parental uh, 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 consent. Your daughters can go get birth control pills without your consent. Your daughters can go get an abortion without your consent. And now, your young daughters or sons uh, can go get a gender reassignment therapy without your consent. Minors can already obtain birth control pills and abortions at Planned Parenthood clinics in many states without parental uh, notification or consent. Imagine what will happen if this person becomes the number two official in charge of the federal agency that sets health policy for the entire United States. Now I could go on to describe the LGBTQ influence in business, you know, in business now require gender sensitivity training. You got to have it. All of a sudden your boss tells you, hey, you know what, next Thursday and Friday, we're all meeting at so-and-so place and we're going to all go through gender sensitivity training. In the military, LGBTQ are allowed to serve, yes, and the government must cover the cost of gender reassignment treatment and surgery for them if they require it. And our taxes pay for it. And of course, the entertainment industry where the most popular and visible people on the planet enthusiastically approve the LGBTQ agenda and lifestyle. Anybody, heard, anybody ever hear of Cher? I mean, she could lead the parade. For example, you can't make a movie today without some type of LGBTQ character or actor nor can you portray this lifestyle negatively because you risk being called out or canceled if you do. This young actress, Gina Carano, who is part of uh, the Star Wars franchise, very popular uh, young actress, you know, she was canned, she was fired because you know, she just spoke her mind about these issues. Uh-uh, you're done, your career is over. 
So in light of all of this, the question that many Christians ask are the following. How did we as a nation get here? And where do we as Christians go from here? So I'm going to try to answer these two questions with the rest of my, with the rest of my lesson. First question, how do we get here? The first gay right organization in the United States was organized by Henry Gerber in December 10th, 1924 and called the Society for Human Rights. Of course it was. <laughs> because if it was called the Society to Help Homosexuals, <laughs> they wouldn't have gotten any public members. <laughs> of course, it was soon disbanded due to political pressure. After various attempts to organize the National Coalition of Gay Organizations, uh, this group published its gay rights platform in 1972, which contained its primary social and political agenda going forward. Now, in all fairness, we have to realize that up until the 60s, homosexuality and other deviations from the norm had been treated as criminal behavior in addition to simply moral or psychological issues. And so there was, uh, you know, there was pushback from this group because they were being treated as criminals and in many instances treated unfairly. But their goal was not simply to normalize these types of behaviors so as to simply be accepted into the social mainstream. This was the argument and this was the public objective that was marketed at the time. In other words, and I remember this, the, 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 the mantra was, look, we just want to be accepted as we are. We know we're different from you people. You know, we're gay, you know what I'm saying? We, we know that's different, and, uh, but all we want is to just be accepted you know, as just ordinary people and treated you know, normally, not be discriminated against, not be beat up because of who we are. You know, that's all we want. That was the selling point. Now, does that sound fair to you? Sounded fair to me. I remember at the time, well, you know, I mean, that was the uh, marketing. But the true goal was to have gay values and thinking and lifestyle dominate the American culture and social values, that was the true goal. We see a glimpse of this in the original platform, which, and I quote, sought the following changes. And this, these are the, these are the um, points that were in the original 1972 platform. Number one, repeal all laws prohibiting private sexual acts involving consenting adults, boom take all of those laws off the books, whatever they are. Two, repeal all prostitution laws, both male and female. Three, repeal all age of consent laws, not lower the age of consent, repeal all the laws. In other words, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 18, 16, 12, or nine, all age of consent laws repeal all of these things. Number four, repeal all legislative provisions that restrict the sex or the number of persons entering into a marriage unit. A man and a man, sure. A man and a woman and a woman, fine. Two men and one woman, okay. Three women and two men, sure, let's go. The more the merrier. And we say, oh, they're crazy. They were crazy. But don't you know today, today, this is, this is going around. There's even a name for it now and it's, it slips my mind. But this is the thing now. This is the latest thing. Like group marriages. Next. Enactment of legislation so that child custody, adoption, so on and so forth, shall not be denied because of sexual orientation or marital status. Number six, encouragement and support for sex education courses 
prepared and taught by gay men and women presenting homosexuality as a valid, healthy preference and lifestyle as a viable alternative to heterosexuality. Not that homosexuality uh, was, uh, was wrong. No, 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 that homosexuality was actually a valued lifestyle. I remember after the book came out, I did some publicity things. I was on some radio programs, you know, talk show type things. And the guy would interview me about the book and blah, blah, blah. And then they'd open the phones. Oh boy, that was fun. They'd open the phones. And I remember one guy in particular who was gay and who called and after calling me a lot of names and so on and so forth and telling me I didn't know what I was talking about and didn't understand how wonderful the, uh, the gay lifestyle was, you know, and uh, you know, it's something to be valued and to be pursued. And, and I answered him, you know, facts, facts are a terrible thing, aren't they, facts? <laughs> I answered him with the facts that I had in front of me at the time about the rate of suicide among homosexuals and transgendered uh, people, uh, the highest the rate of suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse. I said, so if this is the life that you're promoting as you know, the ideal life, you know, the facts don't support it. So this agenda compiled by the Gay Coalition was published in 1972, 50 years ago. So how did we get here? Well, a very determined set of people with a very clear agenda who had powerful allies in the media and entertainment industry simply went about establishing their will and ways, first in entertainment, then in politics, in order to achieve their goal. For example, the GLAD organization, that means Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Their website, listed the ABC television network as the second most gay friendly network in America. First, first network was the CW network, the most gay friendly. ABC of course owns Walt Disney Corporation, which is one of the most gay friendly companies in the United States. They even had an openly gay president. Imagine Walt Disney World, the president of Walt Disney World was an openly gay man. Through media, they have been able to promote this gay agenda for decades. And with Washington's help, the gay agenda became mainstream in the 90s. Now the breakthrough came, however, when they promoted their agenda, not simply uh, as an alternative lifestyle, but rather as a, a, a minority rights. In other words, they pushed their agenda uh, not with the argument, we just want to be accepted. They push their agenda with the argument, we're, in, we're a minority. We, we want our rights. And so they married their cause with the legitimate fight for civil rights fought for by many groups and cultural minorities and handicapped and the poor and women and so on and so forth. So gays argued that they were born gay. The problem is there's no medical proof of this, but who cares when the media is behind you? And so uh, they couldn't help being gay and to oppose them or their lifestyle was just intolerance. I can't help it. I was born gay and you, and you are condemning me for that. That's intolerance. They even gave anybody who was against them a name, homophobia, they invented that name. So if you disagreed or you were, you were a bigot or you were intolerant or you were a homophobe, never mind that you had the facts on your side, that you had 6,000 years of human history on your side, not to mention the Bible on your side, you were no match for the gay PR machine just rumbling right over you. Then along came the lawyers and the politicians looking for a new cause to fight for, another oppressed group to defend. And this group was a lot easier to defend because there was no dirty work. 
You see with minorities, handicapped, the poor, you, you've got to get your hands dirty to help them. If you're a politician, you know, you got to go to the soup kitchen and you got to go to the neighborhood. There are marches and as I say, soup kitchens, violence, you know, and money that you have to spend in order to actually help those people. But gay rights, well, that's a different story. They are as a group fairly wealthy. Many are famous and powerful. Man, this was a political jackpot. Imagine politicians get to crusade as minority or civil rights advocates for people who give them money. <laughs> wow. All they want is to be legitimized by the state and they're willing to pay you, Mr. Politician, to do that. So mix this cocktail together for 50 years and you end up with a president and a large number of politicians actively promoting a piece of legislation called the Equality Act that has been passed by the House of Representatives and has not yet, not as of this writing here, been voted on by the Senate. Now, without going into too much detail, this act, this Equality Act, which is an amendment to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, prevents discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. You can't discriminate against you know, someone who's black or a, you know, a, an ethnic minority or an immigrant or a, a woman or a handicapped person. And now we added a couple of other, a couple of other categories. You can't discriminate against some sexual orientation or gender identity. Now, one ominous note is that this act trumps the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was passed in 1993. This was the law that protected religious people in groups from being forced to do things that were legal, but that were against the moral or the religious beliefs of uh, these individuals. A good example is you know, the Christian bakers who refused to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple, or a Catholic business owners who, who were trying to be forced to provide birth control or abortion for their employees, or ministers who refused to marry same-sex or trans couples. Well, they had the, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to protect them against lawsuits and so on and so forth. Well, if this law passes as is, it gives the LGBTQ plus individuals tremendous legal power to sue individuals and churches who continue to denounce their lifestyle or refuse to offer service uh, on religious grounds. Imagine we've, we've lost a, a youth minister, right? Very young, talented guy, uh, but he's no longer with us. And then sometime in a, you know, who knows when the elders decide uh, this year, next year, let's say we, we're going to put an ad in, we want to find a new youth minister. And so a young youth minister who has a degree in Bible comes to interview and, and the elders, uh, you know, he looks nice and he seems personable and he's got, ex not experience, but he's got an education, so on and so forth. And then they ask about his family background and he says, my husband, Joe. <laughs> His name is Pete, the applicant for the youth minister job. And he says, yeah, my husband, Joe. And the elder saying, excuse me, are you telling me you're married? Yeah. Are you saying to us, you're married to another man? Yes. Yes, I, I'm, 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 I'm openly gay. And the elders you know, say, well, uh, thank you very much for coming down. We'll let you know, you know? and it's, it's for us, you know, that's a no brainer. It's like, well, we're not hiring an openly gay man to be our youth minister. Well, if you uh, don't hire that openly gay man because he's gay, he will sue you. He will sue us for every dime we have and you'll have some 
you know, district attorney that'll be happy, happy to take the case and happy to grind us into the ground over such an, uh, such an, uh, such an issue. Yeah, that's where we're at. Let's, let's never mind getting upset about the paint or the carpet or this or that, you know. There are much bigger things happening out there that could uh, hurt us. So where do we go from here? I mean, if this video gets out there and this law gets passed, you know, I, I, I may just go to jail. <laughs> but where do we go from here? Many Christians think that the, the world is too far gone and, and it's become hopeless to reform it and, and return the United States to being a quote, a Christian nation uh, once again. And others believe that politics will solve the moral deficiencies of our country. I keep hearing it all the time. Let's just elect believing politicians and lobby them to enact laws that will reflect, uh, reflect the Christian views. Well, uh, President Biden claims that he is a devout Catholic. You know, and I've known devout Catholics having grown up in the Catholic church. And none of the devout Catholics that I knew growing up, my aunts and my uncles or my mom or you know, whatever, uh, supported abortion and gay rights but Mr. Biden does enthusiastically. And then there are those who want to fight fire with fire, get nasty, get aggressive and do whatever it takes to gain and keep power and use it for good. You know, America first. I don't believe that Jesus would endorse any of these approaches to achieve his goals because his goals have never been political or based on the search for earthly power. His instructions to his followers at this or any other time in history are the following. Please listen carefully. Let's remember we are not of this world. First John 15, 19, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are only passing through this world waiting for Jesus to equip us with glorified bodies that will enable us to live with God in the kingdom of heaven which is in heaven. Let us not therefore be surprised at what unbelieving, unregenerated people are capable of thinking and doing when their only guide is what they feel or what their hearts, completely devoid of God's word and spirit, leads them to do. Be shocked, be offended, be in disagreement, even angry, but don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged. I mean, it's the world ruled by Satan and captured by sin. What do you expect? Didn't Paul explain the world's condition and God's response to this in Romans chapter one, verses 18 and following, which I will read. Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools 
and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Ever since sin entered the world at the beginning, all the way until Paul the apostle and then forward to our present age and onward to the end of time when Jesus returned, the world was and is and will be a wicked and sinful place. It has always been this way. It will always be this way. And it is so because God has allowed sinful men and women to choose to live and revel in this disbelief and depravity. God says, you want to live like this? Go ahead. You'll pay the price, but go right ahead. Such is the cost for creating human beings with absolute free will. They are in the image of God and God has absolute free will. So if God creates us in his image, then we also have absolute free will. Now I say absolute because man's free will is such that despite the evidence he can, excuse me, that despite the evidence, he can choose to deny even his own creator. That's absolute free will. And Paul says that in the same way, God's absolute free will permits him the right to reject his own creation, knowing that doing so will send the unbeliever into gross acts of sinfulness, spiritual darkness, and eternal death. So we have no mandate to reverse the evil in the hearts and on the hands of the unbelieving sinful generation among whom we find ourselves living for a very short time. We haven't been given that job. So first and foremost, open your eyes to reality. The world is a sinful place and there is no changing that. Don't be shocked. Don't be angry and especially don't be discouraged by this reality. If anything, be sorrowful for what men have done to themselves and to the creation of God. Instruction number two from Jesus. Remember your mission. Our mission is to save souls. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
There are various individuals whose only mission in life is to save animals or save birds or save fish of various kinds. Some people have devoted their lives to saving the planet or the climate, or some save the dignity and human rights of different cultures or social groups or children or the aged or the impoverished or the poor or the sexually confused. These and countless others fighting to preserve ideologies and philosophies and individual freedoms are among the highest ideals and undertaking of those who want to save the world or at least make it a better world. Who are these people? These are humanists. <laughs> That's what we call them. They're humanists and this is their calling to save the world. It's the only world we have, so we better save it. So with all due respect, this is not our calling and it never was our calling. There's no saving this world. It has been marked for complete destruction by God and not man. First, second Peter, excuse me, chapter three, verse 10, Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Does that sound like save the world to you? Oh, someone might say, well, what about Jesus saying that we should be the light and the salt, you know, Matthew 5. Yes, we are to exemplify the character of Christ in this sinful world, but not for the purpose of saving the condition of the world, but to provide light to reveal who can save souls. And that's Jesus Christ. Remember, the first sin was simple disobedience to the one law that God provided man in order to activate his absolute free will. He said, don't eat the fruit. And then the next sin was murder from jealousy and rage, Cain killing Abel, Genesis 4, 8. And then the next sin was sexual in nature. Abel's fifth generation grandson, Lamech, took two wives. This was the first departure from God's original design and command. They called it polygamy. And ever since then, each deviation from God's original command for marriage and human sexuality has been given its own name. Today, we have the alphabet just to keep up. But in all of this evil and departure from God's teachings and commands, let's remember who we are at least. Let's at least remember what we're supposed to be doing. Paul says, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. We're the church. We preserve and proclaim God's truth in season and out of season. We're not here to save the world. We're here to light up the world with the gospel in order to save souls. The world is like a house on fire and the people inside don't know it. And we're yelling, get out, save yourselves. Your house is on fire. Just like Peter did for the crowd in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday in Acts 2.40, it says, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. What was he saying? Get out of the house. Your house is burning down around you. Finally, number three, and I finish with this, trust God, trust God. John 16, 33, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. It's not easy living as a believer in this world, whether you're a teacher or a, a Supreme Court justice, but God has not left us uh, unarmed or unequipped. He's left us 
His word, which is able to help us teach the truth and correct error and discern right from wrong and train us in right living, 2 Timothy 3.16. He's given us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, Acts 2.38, who comforts us, who helps us pray and will resurrect us on the last day, Romans chapter eight. And he's also created the world and human beings with undeniable markers so that we can research and know the actual and marvelous functions of each. Scientific research is the process of knowing what God has already made. And as far as humans are concerned, we can pass laws that permit us to identify as ducks if we want to and punish anybody who refers to us differently. But God has stamped every one of the millions of cells in our bodies with one of only two genders that exist in all of the world throughout history, male or female. That's stamped on every single cell in our bodies. So when judgment comes, God will address you according to how he made you. And he will judge your soul based on your faith in Jesus Christ. And as long as you're alive, you can come to him, no matter how far or broken or lost that you are. And he will not only receive you with love and forgiveness, but he will never leave you or abandon you. So I thank you for your patience and attention concerning this you know, difficult topic, this sexually themed war that we're in. We as Christians are fighting. Don't be discouraged. In the end, the light will reveal everything and God will be honored and Christ's teachings will be confirmed by his coming. And I say to that, amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. That's the end of our lesson for tonight. Thank you for your attention.